Hey guys, today I want to talk a little bit about China, about what's going on with China, also a little bit with Russia today. Um, they've been testing Taiwan a lot recently. They've sent like troop ships filled up with troops to see what China, what uh, Taiwan would do. And it's getting kind of scary to be honest with you. And Dan Bongino the other day was saying on one of his, um, his vlogs that he thinks that something's going on that we're not being told. Um, I guess people have been told up there to get ready to exit. If you're, if you're living in Taiwan and you're, you're working at the embassy or, or, or you're an expat there, you should probably leave. You should probably consider leaving because of the stuff that's going on there. And I'm not sure if that's like a, a pre-warning to something that they know or what's going on, but it's kind of like a signal, like, I mean, if the United States was going to join in, I don't think that they would give that because they, maybe they would, maybe just to, as a safety measure, just to get people out of there because it's going to be the beginning of probably World War Three or whatever. And I don't want to be a, uh, you know, a, a doom and gloom guy. I'm just saying it could happen. Okay, so for you guys that always say I'm, I'm a doomer gloomer, I'm not. I'm just I'm just trying to state that the obvious that you know this could happen, and it seems at some point it will happen. And probably before 2030, um, I, I get a feeling it's going to happen sooner than that. Um, also, there's been talk this past year about Russia trying to form what's called a RIC, R-I-C. Okay, R-I-C is is Russia, India, and China. Now, India, I don't think would would join in on this, and I think they've already kind of stated that. And and the United States has kind of jumped in and says, hey. You know, why don't you join NATO? And and India flat out turned them down, straight out, and says we're not a part of that. We're not, you know, we're not even in that 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 area. You know, so why would we why would we join that? We're not even part of that. You know, so why would India join that? And they straight out turned down Biden um, on that invitation. Now, it's kind of weird because India is a very kind of a peaceful nation, and they don't like China. And that's obvious. They do work with Russia buying weapons off them and things like that. They kind of work with China to a certain extent, but only on terms. You know, they have terms to, to kind of agree to disagree. And they do battle on some of their borders and stuff like that in the mountainous regions with China. And they're not very friendly with China at all. They don't like China. India does not like China at all. And that's why I think we don't ever have to worry about the RIC nations ever getting together and forming something to oppose NATO, okay? But even if China and Russia get together, which they kind of are, but they're really not close friends because they even have border skirmishes a little bit, and they have a couple of towns, I guess, that are Russian towns that are up in China, and they, they, there's people that live up there that are, you know, and, and that kind of puts a damper on things too because Russia says that they want those towns back or whatever. And I think the same goes that they have a couple of Chinese towns that are in Russia that from past border disputes and stuff like that. And that's not really that, that, that big of a deal. You know, those, those things happen sometimes between countries that are not that friendly. But I know that Z is working with Putin a little bit more now. And I think they're willing to ship in weapons for Ukraine and stuff like that. Or maybe they're not. Who knows? You know, I think behind the scenes things are happening, but China kind of says, no, we're not going to do that. But things happen and things show up on the battlefield that are kind of strange sometimes. And you know how that works. I mean, things are always happening behind the scenes. Um, I don't ever see Russia and China getting together unless this gets worse for both of them. And if it gets worse for both of them, I could easily see both of them saying, hey, let's let's get together. We need to get together. We need to come together on this and start working together against NATO or these other nations. And I think both of them are coming to that point where they might do that. At some point, it could happen. I'd hate to see that happen. All of us would hate to see that happen. But I do see at some time, at some point, them doing this. And, and it's it's not a good thing to see that. But if that happens, it certainly gives them um, and and um, NATO a run for for their money because. A lot more planes come on board. A lot more weapons come on board. Russian weapons are not that great. Let's face it. We've we've seen that in the Ukraine war, and also we know that they're out of a lot of ammo. And and for them to you know go to war now, 
it would probably they'd probably have to use some bigger weapons and i'm not talking conventional weapons i'm talking possibly nuclear it might force them into a corner and them saying hey you know hey it's time to use some nuclear weapons and who knows what would happen after that you know it's anybody's guess um i'm sure it wouldn't end well you know one nuclear weapon could set off a whole bunch of nuclear weapons and 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 we all know how that goes and coming from a, um you know the cold war and serving on a a, a nuclear sub two, two nuclear submarines in my life um, you always hope that those weapons would never be be launched from your submarine, you know, and I'd hate to be on a submarine today and hearing the launch for something like that. You can imagine what that would be like and, and, and knowing that your family is probably not going to be there in another 20 or 30 minutes or something. You know, I mean, it's a scary thought. And, you know, I remember being out at sea and doing the drills and stuff like that it, and it's it's scary even doing the drills because it really puts that thought into your mind that hey someday this could happen and it may may happen and probably will happen at some point um hopefully it never happens in our lifetime and certainly you know living here in the philippines kind of alleviates a little bit of that but i don't know if i'd want to live in a a a, a world where nuclear weapons have have gone off you know in my country and in russia and thinking about that, all that nuclear fallout that's going to be going around the world after that, and, and living in that that nuclear world, you know, I, I think I'd rather be on ground zero, to be honest with you, you know, than than live in that. And I'm not trying to be, like I said, Debbie Downer or anything like that, but I mean, we all think of that at some point. And I think we're in a great place if we want to survive. But what would surviving be like here? Because food networks would be, sh you know, shut down. The the the, de the delivery things from the US and Russia and from a lot of those countries close to Russia and the United States, it, cargo ships would be shut down, you know, and, and, and people would be starving in those countries that did survive. Um, everything would be at a standstill throughout the world, mass starvation, things like that. Um, the world would certainly change. And I don't think we're there. I know that, that Biden recently asked China to have talks and they said no. Um, and that in itself is kind of scary that China is not even willing to sit down and talk. I guess they feel like they're better than that and they don't have to. Um, and China's playing a, a long game here, buying these countries and, and giving them big loans and stuff like that. So all this stuff going on, it's really, you know, making the waters really mucky. And it, it's it's changing the politics of the world and we you know we usually don't talk too much about pol american politics on here but we do talk world politics on occasion and it definitely makes things very mucky and i know a lot of expats out there think no this will never happen steve it's just not going to happen and let's hope it doesn't and i'm not saying it is or it isn't so you know i'm trying to pl play mr moderate here on this and you know try to say that let's let's hope and pray that this doesn't work this doesn't work out for China and Russia that they don't they don't try to take over Taiwan and they don't try to take over the Ukraine and they don't you know we don't have any of these issues of Poland or any other country and it seems to be that these leaders are a little bit out of touch with with reality you know and what and they they they're willing to throw 100,000 people to their deaths and and not even care you know in Russia Putin just doesn't care it seems like his own people, the people that are dying, they're not even giving the families any money or anything afterwards. And a lot of Russians are getting really turned off by what's going on in Russian politics. So I don't think that that Putin can survive much longer because I think people even close to him are eventually going to try to take him out for what he's doing. Because people want to see the world at peace. I think Russians are very similar to Americans in, in that respect. I mean, I have had a lot of Russian friends and there's a lot of Russians that took off from Russia and they feel exactly the way Americans feel that they don't want to be at war. You know, there's a lot of Russians coming to the Philippines recently. They went south of here. I think some of them are even down in Dumaguete, I heard. There's a few down there. And there's a lot that was up in Thailand, but they're switching over to Vietnam and a few other places, Cambodia. And there's a few other countries that they went to. Um, there's also Ukrainians that we're seeing over here. Um, and believe it or not, some of the Russians and Ukrainians have actually become friends because the Russians are people that took off because they didn't want to fight. So they became friends with the Ukrainians. I'm um, here and I was reading on one of the expat pages, uh, there, there was a story on there about a Ukrainian that became friends with one of the Russians and they're great friends because of the fact that the guy became kind of a conscientious objector and left the country. And it's, that's a great story when you think about that because you know the, the guy, 
he stepped up to the plate and says, I'm not going to fight for this. Even though it's my country, I'm not going over there and sacrificing my life for something I don't believe in. You know, and you got to give uh, people credit when they do that. You know, we might not believe in their battle, you know, but this is a battle that we certainly do believe in. Most of us as Americans, anyway, that when a Russian conscientious objector steps up to the plate, that's a that's a big thing, you know, and it's it's kind of um, a good quality of that person. You know, we had a lot of people that didn't fight over in Vietnam and stuff like that. And after the war, um, I think we took a second look at those people and said, you know what, they were probably the ones that were right. I mean, granted, our other soldiers went over there and sacrificed their lives, and, and kudos to our Vietnam vets. Obviously, you know, they, they're, they're great men and heroes in our country. But the ones that didn't go over there also, you know, they did something that they believed in. And you, you got to give them, you know, credit for, for, for doing what they believed in. You know, and in the end, when we found out about the Vietnam War after, we kind of found out that the war was a, 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 a fight that we really shouldn't have probably been involved in. You know, and here we are now, we're friends with Vietnam and their form of communism is not a form of communism that's similar to all the other communist countries. It's a really a different country. It's almost like capitalism kind of over there. It's, it, you know, they have street stands and stuff like that over there and the stores and everything. And Vietnam is a different world today. It's, it's almost, you know, it's very, it's a different world. It's not a typical communist country or socialist country. It's just not that way. You know, and it's kind of a beautiful place to be. You know, it's a it's a great place for expats to live too. And, and it's, it's wonderful there. And, you know, it's just, the world's changing. But I, I want to talk about that today because I thought it was kind of a cool subject to talk about. And there's certainly a lot of change going on in the world. And I think a lot of expats are going to see a lot of change over the next five to seven years, maybe sooner. I'm guessing probably sooner. Um, that's my thoughts on it. You know, I think we're going to see some changes within the next year or two um, with China and the U.S. and, and Canada and, and Australia uh, joining in on this stuff and all the Asian countries that are um, joining in with the United States. And I'm not sure how India is going to play into this if we go to war uh, with China over Taiwan. I'm not sure. Um, I wish the best for Taiwan because... I, I, I hope that they stay a free country. You know, I really do. And I think most Americans feel that way. And I think even some of the Chinese people that live in the United States feel that way. I, I When I talk to Chinese people over here, and I talked to several Chinese people just recently, I actually talked to a guy, a taxi cab driver, and uh, um, I'm going to use him for my thumbnail today on this on this video. And he looked kind of like Bong Bong, but he was, he was Chinese. And he agreed with me that... Um, that the Chinese government's not a good government. He, he had told me that, and, and I found that interesting that he had said that. He was part Filipino. I think he's 25% Filipino, I think he said, or something. But he looked just like Bong Bong Marcos. It was, it was kind of an incredible, uh, uncanny resemblance. It looked like a young young Bong Bong, and he was kind of a, a good-looking guy. He was a handsome guy, too, you know, and um, it was interesting to see him as a taxi cab driver because I, I kept looking at him. I said, man, this guy looks just like Bong Bong. But anyway, guys, wanted to talk about that subject. I thought it was a bit... I thought it would be a great subject to talk about today, but God bless, guys. Take care.